Hello YouTube and welcome to another video and today we are discussing a pretty big topic which is what is the difference between turbochargers and superchargers? Is one better than the other and which one should you choose if you are planning on boosting your vehicle? Now the majority of you watching this video probably already know how a turbocharger and a supercharger works but for those of you that don't let me give a brief introduction to how they operate and for that let's head to the whiteboard. There are two main ways to get more power out of a car's engine. The first is to improve the internal efficiency of the engine. This is just making sure that there are no internal losses due to friction, uh, make it easier for the car to be able to push the exhaust gases out, that sort of thing. And then the second main way is to be able to burn more fuel effectively. Effectively is the key word there. You can't just go and pump more fuel into the car and expect to get more power. You need to also provide it with more air. And ambient air pressure can only do so much for you. So if you want to be able to give the car more air than what it normally is able to take, you're going to need to pressurize the air that's on the intake side. And this is the concept behind turbochargers and superchargers. And the way that they do this is different between the two. So the way that the turbocharger works is it consists of two portions. You have a compressor housing and you have a turbine housing. And when the car is running, you have exhaust gases that are then channeled into the exhaust inlet of the turbine portion. This spins a turbine fan and then the exhaust gas exits the car normally. This turbine fan is connected through a shaft to an impeller which sits inside the compressor portion of the turbocharger. This impeller draws air in and compresses it and then sends it into the engine. This is a very effective means of being able to use some of the normally lost energy of the exhaust and make it work for you to compress air and then feed back to the engine and give it more power. The supercharger, however, works in a slightly different manner. It doesn't make use of the exhaust gases coming out of the car to drive your compressor. Instead, it uses the main drive belt off of the car. Now, the supercharger that I've decided to draw here is a Procharger style of supercharger. That means it has a similar style compressor on the front of it, making it look much like a turbocharger when you're looking at it from the front. But on the back side, it's a little bit of a different story. You have a uh, pulley here, which runs off of that serpentine belt. So you'll install some idler pulleys and use a slightly longer belt to route it around the pulley on the back of the supercharger. And then there is a gearbox system here, which changes the RPMs of this pulley to match the RPMs of the impeller that you want to get the desired compression. Both are effective means of being able to deliver increased pressures on the intake manifold, but they also come with their own individual complexities. So now let's go over some of the selling points as well as things you need to be aware of when looking at both parts, and we'll start with cost. Generally, superchargers are more cost effective than turbochargers, and this is usually due to the lack of additional parts that you need on the supercharger side versus the turbo. With the supercharger, all you're doing is you're adding some additional intake plumbing, and you need to route some pulleys and things to get it to go to the supercharger. Whereas with the turbocharger, you need to add plumbing both on the intake side as well as on the exhaust side, changing up the manifold. And if you have a V configuration engine, you're probably also looking at a twin turbo setup. So they oftentimes end up running a couple of thousand dollars more. If we look at kits for the VQ37 engine, for instance, a supercharger kit will typically run you about six to nine thousand dollars, whereas most turbocharger kits start at eight grand and will go up to well above ten thousand dollars. Also with turbocharger kits, you're usually looking at some custom fabrication work if they don't provide you with an exhaust manifold. With a turbocharger, you're going to need to route the exhaust from each of your cylinders through the turbine housing. And if the kit that you're buying doesn't already come with that custom uh, manifold, you're gonna need to fabricate your own. And all these things add up to turbochargers generally being more expensive than supercharger systems. There are, of course, exceptions to this depending on the style of supercharger that you go for, or if you decide to go for a single turbo setup versus a twin, but generally you'll be spending more money with a turbo system. There are also other things to consider, such as maintenance. In both cases, you will be adding additional maintenance items to your list. Oil changes are gonna to have to be more frequent. You'll probably be changing out spark plugs more frequently as well. You'll have to be inspecting additional intake hoses. But superchargers have one additional maintenance item that you have to look at that turbochargers don't have to deal with, and that is the condition of the belt. You have to make sure you are keeping good track of the belt that runs the supercharger, especially if you've added additional belt to the system. You have to make sure it's not rotting out, and you have to make sure you're not getting a whole ton of belt slip off of the supercharger. So this is just one additional thing that you will have to consider if you decide to get a supercharger. From a reliability standpoint, both systems can be equally reliable, assuming that they are properly installed and maintained with good care. 
With the turbocharger, you want to make sure you keep a close eye on those oil changes because of the fact that it runs hotter than a supercharger. It's going to be burning through oil much quicker. So you got to make sure you keep an eye on oil changes from the supercharger standpoint. Just make sure you're taking good care of that belt so that you're not getting slip and that the belt isn't rotting away. But if properly maintained, both should be equally reliable in their power deliveries. There's another face to this, which is serviceability. Generally, superchargers will sit on top of the engine or in front of it where it's fairly easy to gain access to it. Turbochargers, on the other hand, will oftentimes be mounted near the exhaust ports on the car, and this sometimes means that they are really buried in the engine bay, requiring you to pull the engine just to be able to service the turbo. This isn't always the case. You can have a top-mounted turbo where it's more easy to get to, but oftentimes you will see that turbochargers are much harder to gain access to if in the event you do need to maintenance it. Serviceability also goes hand in hand with ease of installation, and if you're planning on installing the system yourself, this is something you may want to heavily consider. Superchargers are generally easier to install than turbos. With a turbocharged system, as I mentioned earlier, you typically do have to pull the engine. That requires you to have an engine hoist and a lift, and if you haven't pulled an engine before, it could be really difficult and there's a lot of risk that something could go wrong. With a supercharger system, you don't have to pull the engine at all. You're just going to be slapping it on top of the engine or in front of it, wherever it happens to sit, and it's just overall easier to install than a turbocharger system. One of the distinct advantages of superchargers is the fact that you can maintain your current exhaust system. If you really like the way your car sounds, you don't have to change it. You'll have the exact same headers, the exact same catalytic converters or test pipes, whatever it is you happen to have, it's not going to change. But with a turbocharger, you do need to install a new exhaust manifold to be able to route all of the exhaust gases through your turbine housing, which brings me to another subject, which is heat soap. Turbochargers will run a lot hotter than a supercharger does because of the fact that you are forcing all of your exhaust gases through that turbine housing. This causes a ton of heat to be built up on that side of the turbo, so generally you want to put some sort of heat blanket or something around it to keep that heat maintained so it doesn't soak into the intake and cause your intake temperatures to rise. Another thing you may be considering is fuel efficiency, and for this, turbochargers will almost always beat out superchargers. The reason for this is they are able to make use of the normally wasted exhaust gas by putting it to work to have it drive the turbine. And this then allows you to drive the compressor so that the car doesn't have to do as much work pulling the air into the engine. So if you're sitting at idle, for instance, you won't be using as much fuel. And this is why a lot of auto manufacturers are switching to smaller displacement engines and installing small turbos on them. It's to be able to increase the fuel efficiency of the vehicle while still maintaining the power output. Superchargers, on the other hand, just add another parasitic to the system. It adds another component that the engine has to drive. Almost like adding a second AC system into the car, you're adding another accessory that the drivetrain has to drive. So, for this reason, turbochargers will be more fuel efficient than superchargers. So now we're going to get to what for most of y'all is probably the deciding factor on the turbo versus supercharger debate, and that is going to be dyno performance. So what I've plotted here are the stock numbers from a 370Z, the solid line here, is the horsepower curve and the dotted line, the torque curve. If you guys have not watched my video on horsepower versus torque, I highly recommend taking a look at it. It explains the relationship between these two curves quite nicely. And when we're evaluating the performance of the supercharger and turbos, we will largely be looking at the torque curves here. So for a stock 370Z, we get a peak horsepower number of around 290 horsepower and a peak torque of around 240 foot-pounds. And one interesting thing to note is that past about 4,000 RPM, we see that that torque curve begins to die down. This is because at higher RPMs, the engine is having trouble being able to suck in air to be able to fill the cylinder properly. It's not able to get all that air in to be able to burn the fuel that it needs to maintain that torque curve at higher RPMs. And this is part of what the supercharger aims to solve. So if we plot also a still-in supercharger, which is the most common blower kit that you can buy for a 370 or a G37, anything with the VQ37 platform, we can see that this torque curve is maintained even in the higher RPMs, peaking out at about 300 foot-pounds of torque. We also get a very linear torque curve across the entire line. This is because the boost from the supercharger and the volume of air that it's able to give to the car is largely related to the RPMs as it is directly driven by the belt. As a result of this new torque curve, the Z now sees a total horsepower of about 425, according to Stillen's numbers. Obviously, uh, in practice, we've seen it's closer to about 390 horsepower or so, but we get the idea. The supercharger has a very linear torque curve, and it does give a dramatic increase in horsepower. In this case, over 125 horsepower of gain. So how do these numbers compare to that of a turbo kit? 
Well, one of the most popular kits for the 370Z is the AAM Twin Turbo Kit. And if we plot the horsepower and torque numbers here, we can see that we are capable of getting much higher peak horsepower and torque numbers, peaking out at around 560 horsepower and about 500 foot-pounds of torque. So why is it that the Twin Turbo Kit is able to make so much more power? Well, this is largely because a turbocharger is designed to be able to spin at higher RPMs than most superchargers can. And as a result of this, it's able to apply more boost to the intake manifold and therefore get you much higher horsepower numbers. This isn't really a fair comparison, however, noting the discrepancy in the peak horsepower here, but with some small modifications to the Stilling kit, similar to what Top Gun Speedworks has done with their kit by adding a smaller pulley, as well as integrating an intercooler, we can get some similar peak horsepower numbers to most twin turbo setups. And now the story of the difference in power delivery between a supercharger and a turbocharger can clearly be seen here. If there's one graph that you should remember from this entire video, it's this one. So what we can see here is once again, the supercharger has a very linear torque curve across the entire RPM range as the torque is largely governed by the volume of air that the supercharger is able to put through the intake, which is in turn a result of the RPMs themselves. However, with the turbocharger kit, it's a much different story. We can see that this torque curve quickly ramps up past 3000 RPM, all the way up to 500 foot-pounds of torque. It is a very common misconception that turbochargers are not able to give you the same amount of boost as a supercharger at lower RPMs. Depending on the design of the turbocharger kit, if you use smaller turbos, for instance, you are able to hit peak boost a lot quicker, getting very quickly up to 500 foot-pounds in this case. However, there's a trade-off there. If you're able to hit that boost early on, those smaller turbos are going to have trouble keeping up at higher RPMs as they're not able to continue to provide the volume of air that you need to maintain the torque curve. So we see that it very quickly begins to die off here, and that's when the supercharger is able to catch up and then meet the similar horsepower figure that we see here. If we were to set up a hypothetical race between these two cars, even though they have the same peak horsepower number, it would be expected that the turbocharged car would win because of its ability to be able to ramp up that torque curve so quickly. And this debunks the myth that turbochargers cannot spool up and get you the same sort of boost that a supercharger can at lower RPMs. They are assuming you've designed it under correct restraints, you've chosen the correct turbocharger for your setup, you can get better performance and power delivery across an RPM range with a turbocharged vehicle over a supercharged car. There are of course some different things you can do here to the turbocharger. If you wanted to get higher peak horsepower numbers, you could use a larger spool, but it would shift your entire torque curve further to the right, and it would mean that you are sacrificing some of that boost at lower RPM simply due to turbo lag. But in general, turbos will be better for power. One interesting thing to note about this plot, by the way, if we follow the supercharger's torque curve all the way up to past 6,000 RPM, we can suddenly see that that torque curve begins to die off as well and it closely follows that of the turbocharger. So what's exactly going on here? Well, the turbocharger and the supercharger have approximately the same amount of boost at this point, but the problem is the intake valves are opening and closing so fast that you're not able to shove enough air into the cylinders to be able to continue to increase in your torque figure. In a sense, you're kind of choking the engine. And as a result, that torque curve does begin to fall off because we are not able to provide the volume of air into the cylinder because of that choke point. How exactly do we get around this choking? One thing you can do is you can mess with the cam timing, you can leave the intake valve open a little bit longer. This will allow more air to funnel in through to the cylinder. You can also mess with the intake port size, you can port the cylinder head, as well as increase your valve size, and this will also allow more area for air to come through and get into the cylinders. So to summarize, which is better here? A turbocharger or a supercharger? Which one should you install if you're looking to boost your car? This is gonna largely depend on what your bottom line is, and there's no wrong or right answer here. If you're looking for the highest peak horsepower number possible, a turbocharger is gonna be your best bet. It's easier to get those higher horsepower figures than you can on a supercharger. Just keep in mind that most turbo kits are gonna cost more, and if you need to pay somebody to install it, it's gonna be more in labor as most likely you'll be dropping the engine. If you're like me, however, and you want to install the kit yourself, and you're trying to keep this at a slightly lower cost, a supercharger is gonna be a better bet. Yes, you won't get the same peak horsepower numbers, but if you don't care about hitting 550, 600 horsepower, something really ridiculous, then a supercharger is gonna work just fine for you. It also has a very linear torque curve. It makes it a little more predictable, which is something that I would prefer. A lot of people, however, like to feel that very quick ramp up in power as the boost begins to kick in, and so a turbocharger might be a better bet for you. Just keep in mind, though, that that non-linear torque curve 
also means that you may get some stabilities in the wheels. If you hit boost too quickly, you can oftentimes break traction. It just makes it a little bit less predictable. But really, it all comes down to preference, guys. And there is no wrong or right answer here. It all depends what you want to get out of the car. And that is it for this video, guys. Thank you once again for watching. If you are new to the channel, I will be installing a supercharger in a couple of months. So if you want to see the installation process of that and follow my build, make sure you hit that subscribe link down below. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Later.